Today is September 19, 2016, 9.05. Welcome to today's Police Fatality Public Fact-Finding Review concerning the death of Thomas James McEnery that took place on November 24, 2015. I am Carlos Blumberg, and I will be presiding over today's proceeding. This review is being held because the Clark County District Attorney's Office has made a preliminary determination that no criminal prosecution of the officers involved of the death of Mr. McEnry is appropriate. Clark County Ordinance Net Chapter 2.12 requires a public review following such a determination. This is not a trial. The purpose of today's proceeding is to present the public with the essential facts concerning the death of Mr. McHenry. Chief Deputy District Attorney Tim Fatigue will present today's fact-finding review on behalf of the District Attorney's Office. He will determine the witness or witnesses to be called. The ordinance does not provide subpoena power on my behalf and does not allow for any other party to call witnesses. Attorney Conrad Klaus has been appointed to be the Ombudsman. He represents both the public and Mr. McHenry's family. He will have the opportunity to ask questions of the witness or witnesses. The procedure for questioning witnesses shall be informal, with a view to providing the public with the relevant information regarding the use of force. The rules of evidence shall not be strictly enforced. Members of the public observing this review may submit, writ may submit proposed written questions on forms located in the back of the room and present it to one of the officers. I will ask the questions unless I determine that it is irrelevant, redundant, or an abuse of the re review process. At the conclusion of this review, no formal determination regarding the matter of cause of death shall be rendered. To either of the parties, do either of the parties have anything else to add? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. If not, Mr. Fittig, please feel free to call your witness. Thank you. Sir, could you please state your name, spell your last name, state your occupation, and your general responsibilities in that position? Mark Colon, C-O-L-O-N. I'm a detective with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department for the force investigation team. We investigate officer-involved shootings, deadly uses of force, and in-custody deaths. On November 24th of 2015, did you respond in the early morning hours to the scene of an officer-involved shooting? And if so, could you describe the general area where it occurred? Yes. <clears throat> it is bordered by Katy to the north, Maryland Parkway to the east, and Cambridge Street to the west. There is an entrance to the uh, French Oaks Complex on Maryland Parkway, and there's also one uh, on Katy. This is a closer picture of the officer-involved shooting location. It happened in the parking lot in a small enclosure in the northwest corner of the lot. This is a ground view photo showing the officer's locations and McHenry's location. Which officers were involved in the firing of their guns and can you provide some details regarding the countdowns of their duty weapons? The involved officers were Officer Kyle Pryor, Officer Robert Nord, and Officer Donald Sutton. The countdowns, Officer Pryor's weapon was an H&K 9mm with a magazine capacity of 18 rounds. The countdown and evidence at the scene revealed three rounds were fired. Officer Nord's weapon was a Glock 17 9mm, magazine capacity of 17 rounds. Countdown and evidence revealed three rounds were fired. And Officer Sutton's weapon was a Smith & Wesson 9mm, magazine capacity of 17 rounds. Countdown and evidence revealed two rounds were fired. Were there other witnesses to the events of that morning? Yes, there were two. There was a Metro officer, Thomas Griffin, and a French Oaks security officer. Did you investigate the decedent and the weapon that he used that day? Yes, our decedent is Thomas James McHenry. At the time of his death, he was 32 years old. He also went by Thomas Williams and Thomas Bunch. Uh, McHenry's vehicle 
was a 1994 Mitsubishi Mirage. It was unregistered. The plates on it that night belonged to a different vehicle, which police commonly refer to as being cold plated. His weapon was a Stinger P9T, which was a six millimeter airsoft pistol. Did you attend the autopsy of the decedent? And if so, what were the significant findings? Yes. The autopsy was conducted by Dr. Lisa Gavin on November 25th, 2015. Uh, she opined the cause of death to be multiple gunshot wounds and the manner was homicide. The toxicology revealed that McEnery was positive for methamphetamine intoxication, measured at 1,000 nanograms per milliliter in his blood. For a point of reference, above 200 nanograms uh, can lead to possible violent irrational behavior. McHenry's injuries, as noted in the autopsy, there were four entrance wounds, three to the chest and one to the left upper back. There were two graze wounds, one to the right thigh and left arm, and a through and through to the left wrist area. What events led up to this officer-involved shooting? At 1.59 a.m., Officer Pryor attempted a car stop on a vehicle that had a license plate that did not belong to the vehicle near 1750 Karen Avenue. The vehicle fled southbound in the area of La Cunada Street towards Vegas Valley Drive. Officer Nord located the vehicle at Maryland Parkway and Desert Inn Road where it ran a red light traveling southbound. Next, Officer Griffin located the vehicle westbound Sierra Vista Drive from Maryland Parkway. The vehicle turned southbound onto Cambridge Street. Sergeant Parker advised units to back off. Officer Griffin advised a vehicle turned eastbound onto Katy Avenue. Officer Griffin then broadcasted the vehicle was now blacked out with no one driving and the vehicle was rolling toward the intersection of Maryland Parkway. Officer Griffin pulled in front of the vehicle and stopped it before it got to Maryland Parkway. A citizen across the street from the French Oaks advised Officer Pryor that his subject ran southbound and jumped over the fence into the French Oaks apartments. This is an overview map showing you Katy Avenue. The OIS location is uh, the red square and uh, McHenry's vehicle was unoccupied rolling down uh, eastbound on Katy and that shows Officer Griffin pulled his patrol vehicle in front of it to stop it from going into the to Maryland Parkway. Uh, the park to the north of French Oaks is where the citizen observed uh, a, a male jumping over the fence into the French Oaks apartment complex. French Oaks security made contact with McEnery, who was, who was manipulating vehicle door handles. When confronted about it, McEnery told him it was his sister's vehicle. After being questioned further, McEnery, admit, McEnery admitted it was not his sister's car. McEnery attempted to exit towards Maryland Parkway. The security guard instead escorted McEnery toward the Katy Avenue exit where he, where he entered from. Officer Pryor then made contact with McHenry and requested a code red. A code red is police term for uh, a critical incident is occurring on the radio and for no one to accept essential radio traffic to use the radio, the police radio. McHenry ran, after contact with Officer Pryor, McHenry ran north through the complex into an enclosed area. Officers Nord and Sutton arrived and posted outside of the enclosed area to the east of Officer Pryor and McHenry. Officer Pryor deployed his taser on McHenry. Officer Nord broadcasted shots fired. Were the officers involved all wearing body cameras? Yes, all the officers were wearing body cameras. And first we'll have Officer Pryor's body cam video. To set it up, it'll start with Officer Pryor is pulling into the complex. You'll see McHenry walking with the security guard when Officer Pryor exits his vehicle. Officer Pryor asks where he's coming from, and he tells McHenry to put his hands on the bumper of the vehicle. 
At that time, Montgomery runs north, eventually stopping in the enclosed area in the northwest corner of the parking lot. coming from? Put your hands on the bumper. Put your fucking hands on the bumper. Get on the ground. North 7, go red. Get on the ground. Let me see your fucking hands. Get on the ground. On your stomach. Get down on the ground. Let me see your hands! Put your fucking hands up! Do it now, I will shoot you in the fucking face! I got a little info. Can you show the view from Officer Pryor's body camera in slow motion as well as still photographs of some of the relevant events? Yes, next will be the slow motion video. It'll start after the taser is deployed and McHenry goes down. You'll see him reach for and grab the gun that's on the ground. Next, we have some still photographs from that video. This one shows McHenry standing in the corner of the enclosed area with his hands behind his back. And this uh, photograph shows McHenry with the gun in his hand. Please show the video from Officer Nord and Officer Sutton's body cameras. This will be Officer Nord's body cam video. To set it up, Officer Nord is driving east on Katy when he hears Officer Pryor ask for a code red. Officer Nord makes a U-turn and turns into the complex where McEnery has already run into the enclosed area. While giving verbal commands, you can hear Officer Nord say, gun, gun, gun. Code red. Keep on, keep on. Put your hands out your head, bro. We're gonna get you. Or north side of French Hill, northwest corner, we're like in a little gated. Next is Officer uh, Sutton's body cam video. To set it up, Officer Sutton was taking a position on Cambridge, south of Katy. He heard the code red, 
and pulled into the parking lot after the arrival of Officer Nord. When the shots occurred, where was Officer Griffin, and can you show his body camera footage? Sir, when the shots occurred, Officer Griffin was, he's the officer who had stopped McHenry's vehicle from rolling uh, on Katy into the intersection of Maryland Parkway. The video starts with Officer Griffin running towards the uh, incident location, and we uh, cut it down to when he already arrives a little bit closer to the area. He hit? I got it. I got it. Are we got medical cover? Was there an analysis done as to the position of the decedent and the officers during the incident? Yes. Uh, this, this is an overview diagram of the officers' positions according to the body cam uh, footage, also McHenry's position. This is a street level photograph with measurements. The total uh, measurements of the enclosure from north to south, it measures 27 feet 7, in seven inches, and from east to west, it measures 21 feet. You'll see officers Sutton and Nord are on the outside of that enclosure, approximately seven yards front, or 21 feet from McHenry, who's in the back northwest corner of the enclosure, and Officer Pryor is uh, approximately five yards away or 15 feet from McHenry. Did crime scene analysts come out to the scene, and if so, what were some of their significant findings? Yes, crime scene analysts did respond. This is a picture of where they found, we found the firearm marked by placard 12. There's a close-up of McHenry's gun. There is a photograph of the magazine that was in McHenry's gun. You'll see the green airsoft projectiles. This is the entrance to the enclosure. You'll see it's very narrow. It measures 16 inches wide into the uh, area. This is a photograph showing a glove. The significance of this photo is the matching glove was found in McHenry's vehicle. And did the crime scene analyst also document uh, the decedent's vehicle? Yes, we conducted a search of McHenry's vehicle. This shows 
where Officer Griffin had stopped his vehicle from rolling. It's another photograph of McHenry's vehicle. This is the inside of McHenry's vehicle in the front passenger seat. As you can see by the circles, there's two of those uh, green projectiles and the glove on the seat. It's a close up. This was found in the back seat. It's a bag with a, quite a few projectiles in it. This is uh, McHenry's jacket with two taser prongs in the jacket, one to the uh, upper area, one in the right pocket. Our investigation showed that only one prong made contact with uh, McHenry's body, so he did not experience full neuromuscular incapacitation. Did any of the officers involved in the shooting provide an interview with detectives, and if so, what information was provided? Yes, Officer Nord chose to give FIT investigators a statement. His statement is as follows. Officer Pryor broadcasted he was conducting a vehicle stop on a cold-plated vehicle, but the vehicle was not stopping. While driving toward Officer Pryor's location, Officer Nord observed McHenry driving southbound through the intersection of Maryland Parkway and Desert Inn Road. Officer Nord conducted a U-turn and observed McHenry go west on Sierra Vista Drive where Officer Griffin attempted to stop him. McHenry did not comply, at which time Sergeant Parker broadcasted all units to back away from the decedent's vehicle. Officer Nord utilized the bubble tactic, which is a moving containment of the suspect vehicle at a safe distance to aid in the apprehension of the suspect. Officer Griffin broadcasted the vehicle was empty and rolling east on Katy Avenue toward Maryland Parkway. It was broadcasted, a citizen advised the subject from the vehicle ran toward the French Oaks complex. Officer Pryor broadcasted he made contact with the subject inside the complex. As Officer Nord pulled up to the gate, he observed McHenry running north through the parking lot. Officer Nord exited his vehicle and observed McHenry run into, the enclosed, into an enclosed area. Officer Nord approached McHenry and stayed on the outside of the enclosed area while Officer Pryor followed McHenry into the area. Both officers gave numerous commands for McHenry to show his hands. Officer Sutton arrived and took a position just north of Officer Nord on the outside of the enclosed area. McHenry placed, placed both of his hands into the back of his waistband and went down to both knees. McHenry continued to reach into his waistband despite numerous commands to show his hands. Officer Pryor deployed his taser. Officer Nord observed only one probe made contact in McHenry's upper chest area. Officer Nord believed McHenry had a brief involuntary reaction to the taser, which caused him to raise his arms. At that time, a firearm fell out of McHenry's rear waistband onto the ground. Officer Nord observed McHenry reach for and pick up the firearm and turn toward Officer Pryor. Officer Pryor perceived, I'm sorry, Officer Nord perceived Officer Pryor to be in immediate danger of being shot and fired his gun three times at McHenry to stop him. Officer Pryor requested medical units for McHenry. The officers approached and Officer Nord handcuffed and searched McHenry. The officers determined medical units would not be able to fit their gurney into the enclosure. The officers carried McHenry out of the enclosed area and removed the handcuffs while medical personnel arrived. Did you con conduct an investigation into the de decedent's background that might explain his state of mind during the events of that morning? Yes, we did. Our Follow-up investigation revealed that McHenry had a history of methamphetamine use, depression, and a suicide attempt. From 2009 to 2013, he was incarcerated in the Nevada Department of Corrections for burglary and attempt grand larceny and paroled on December 26th of 2012. While in prison, McHenry spent majority of his time in the psychiatric ward due to his depression. After being released from prison, McHenry was on medication for his depression and no longer using meth. He was employed as an electrician until October of 2015 when he was fired. McHenry fell back into his depression and began to isolate himself from his family. 
Approximately three weeks before the officer involved shooting, McHenry told his wife he was leaving. McHenry took both vehicles when he left and did not disclose where he was going. On November 20th, McHenry spoke with his wife. He told her he had been hiding for three days. McHenry was extremely agitated and paranoid. McHenry became angry and hung up on her. The uh, force investigation team was contacted by our robbery detail. They informed us that they had an active case where McHenry was the suspect. Uh, the details of their case showed that McHenry entered Home Depot and shoplifted items. When he exited, security attempted to detain him. McHenry pulled a black handgun from his waistband and pointed it at security. McHenry entered a white Mitsubishi four-door with a black hood and drove off. And we have photographs from the security officer's phone at the Home Depot. Here you can see him holding a black firearm next to the car. And this also shows the firearm in his left hand and the Mitsubishi with the black hood. That will conclude presentation on behalf of the state. Would you like to take a break? Okay, we'll take a five-minute break. Thank you.
Good morning. It's Carl Spumberg. Just go back on the record. Um, I just have a few questions uh, just to follow up. With respect to the enclosed area, what, what is that for? We don't know. It, it looks like maybe garbage. You could put a garbage bin there, but it's just a small area with only a 16-inch opening to get in there. Was there not next, next to the uh, automatic gate. Was there an opportunity for um, um, for uh, Thomas to jump over that wall? No, it's pretty high wall, it's at least okay. six or seven feet. That's qu the questions I have. So we'll go forward with uh, Mr. Klaus. Thank you, Honor. Um, if, if I might, I'll remain sitting to ask these questions. Absolutely. I better use the microphone. Um, let's ask about the enclosure because that's what, what his honor was just asking about. Um, I think we may have had some confusion earlier. It, um, Detective, is it your indication that the decedent uh, jumped the wall to the enclosure or w was there any other walls that he jumped? No, he ran into the enclosure through that small opening. Do you have any indication that he jumped any wall uh, in the, so it's all, uh, it was all going through the, uh, that, I think you described it as about 18 inches uh, wide uh, gap. 16, yeah. Oh, I apologize. Um, if I might, what is the Metropolitan Police Department's policy for moving injured suspects or victims? There's no actual policy on moving injured suspects or vic victims. Our use of force, of policy, use of force policy states that if an application of force results in injury, the officer will monitor the suspect and summon medical attention. In this case, they did both of those, as well as they determined medical personnel would not be able to fit their gurney into that small uh, entrance to the enclosure. So that's why they moved McHenry out of the area so medical uh, can put him on the gurney. Well, the medical personnel are um, presumably better trained to to move somebody. Why was Mr. McHenry not moved by medical personnel? Why didn't they go into the enclosure rather than the, the officers? Yeah, uh, Officer Norton, in his statement, just told us they just decided the gurney wouldn't be able to fit in there, so they decided to move him out of the area to better help medical personnel. Who, who decided? Was it medical personnel that made that call or one of the, the officers. officers? Do you know which officer? In Officer Nord's statement, he says they decided. Okay. Um, who, who, who would have had the responsibility at that scene, at that moment, to make that call? Was there an officer that you could determine would be lead or responsible? No, I don't believe there was a sergeant at the scene. So, I mean, on the in the body cam video, you can kind of hear them talking about, mm -hmm. let's move them out of here. It was stated um, in the coroner's report that the taser, uh, the taser prongs made contact uh, with Mr. McHenry. Um, is it policy to continue to, uh, subdue, the, to subdue a subject even after uh, a taser is making contact, albeit I think it's described as imperfect contact? Yes, each application of force has to be justified. So each pull of the taser trigger has to be justified. According to Officer Nord, McHenry did not experience full neuromuscular incapacitation. After the first taser pull and the gun fell out, the th according to Officer Nord, the threat level changed to deadly force when McHenry reached for and grabbed the gun. We keep talking about taser pulls and talking about contact, but I, I don't know that we ever described how a taser works or what you mean by a taser pull, could, could you share with us? Sure, the taser looks like a gun, has a trigger. When you pull the trigger, two prongs shoot out approximately 21 feet and uh, hit the suspect. This one, it looks like only one hit the suspect, hit McHenry, so he didn't get the full effects of the taser. The Trigger pull will last five seconds. Uh, and, and what does a trigger pull do? It, electricity into, into the prongs. 
Well, both taser prongs hit Mr. McHenry, at least insofar as you showed us a photo where there were prongs embedded in that leather or leather jacket. When you say hit, do you mean only one of them actually made, only penetrated his body? According to the coroner's report, only one, there was a mark in his chest area that matched the location on the jacket. It appears the other one hit the right jacket pocket, which will be two levels of material before the skin. So that may explain why he didn't feel the full effects. What happens with a taser, at least most typically, when you have good contact with two prongs? The person will go into full neuromuscular incapacitation. They'll fully lock up. Their muscles will seize up? Yes. What happens when you, like in this case, where you have an imperfect contact? They may feel a short effect of the electricity, which appears what happened here. That's where we hear Mr. McHenry making some sounds that sound like perhaps he's feeling some kind of pain. Yes, the initial shock. Is it, when you say they may, do you have an indication here as to whether or not he was feeling the full effect? According to Officer Nord's statement, he thought it looked like he had a temporary effect. But obviously, through the video, it does not look like he had the full effect of the taser. So after that, and your indication is that there was a single pull, a single five-second pull. Yeah, we downloaded the taser, which shows the activity on the taser. And it shows at that time the trigger was only pulled once. When you say downloaded, you mean the taser itself keeps an onboard record as to how it's been used? Yes. Could they have pulled it a second time? No, it does not show a second time the trigger was pulled. I'm asking in a speculative manner, could it have been pulled a second time? Not according to the taser download. No, no, I'm not asking whether or not there's a possibility that it actually was. I'm asking what the effect would have been if an officer had made but did not make the decision to trigger the taser a second time. Well, according to Officer Nord, who gave us the statement, in this particular instance, the threat level changed after that first taser pull. So it went from the taser to deadly force when they saw the gun in his hand, when Officer Nord saw the gun in his hand. I think he gave them to us again, but what are the measurements of that enclosure that we're talking about? Yes, obviously the opening again is 16 inches to enter the enclosure. From north to south, it measures 27 feet 7 inches, and east to west, it measures 21 feet. Was there a video available from, and by available I mean was there a video system at the apartment complex? Yes, there was a video system at the complex. We called out our multimedia forensic analyst who impounded the video. He determined that the camera was both inoperable at the time of the incident and the camera that they did have was pointed in a different direction. This may refer back to the bubble that you mentioned during your presentation, but if the officers were told to back off by Sergeant Parker, and I'll refer you to page 4 of Officer Nord's statement, why did the officers continue to pursue Mr. McHenry's vehicle? Okay, according to the officers, to Officer Nord, officers were never in actual pursuit with lights and sirens. Officer Pryor initiated the initial car stop. McHenry fled. He did not pursue. Officer Griffin located McHenry and broadcasted McHenry's direction of travel. That's when Sergeant Parker broadcasted units to back off. They did back off, but McHenry was still visible on the street. Officer Griffin then located McHenry's vehicle rolling down Katy, unoccupied, towards Maryland Parkway. 
So there's a, uh, uh, excuse me, I, were you, I think I interrupted. Are you, were you finished? I'm, I'm finished. Um, when you say there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a, a pursuit, uh, it sounds like you're referring to a term of art, a, a, a pursuit. Does pursuit mean you've got lights and siren and are in close contact? Yes. Um, but, but not being a pursuit doesn't mean they were letting Mr. McHenry just go. Correct. What, what's our middle ground? The bubble tactic is when officers in the area, area parallel the area. And if they see, they still have a vision of, this, of the suspect vehicle if it comes out in front of them or if the, the uh, person in the vehicle that they're looking for uh, exits that vehicle. Um, why, why do, uh, if you know, in this case, why was a bubble tactic employed? I, I don't know why they do that. Do you have any idea why it's normally employed? I mean, it was because, maybe, it was because uh, all the officers were in the area. They did not want to pursue because that raises the danger level for the, them and the, the citizens in the area. So a bubble tactic is a safe way to stay in somewhat close proximity to a suspect vehicle. I want to clarify, other than the, the cold plate, and by cold plate we're referring to a plate that doesn't at least outwardly belong on the vehicle that you're reading at. Um, at that point, the officers were unaware of any other reason to... Correct. The only re reason he was pulled over was that cold plate. Yeah, there's no knowledge at this point about a, a shoplift or anything. They did not know any of that information. Okay. Um, is it common for officers to, call pla to, excuse me, to run plates on vehicles as they're on, on the roadway? Yes. So there wasn't, they weren't looking for this particular car or anything? No, they just run plates. Um, on page, I believe, 30 of Officer Nord's uh, statement, he indicates that uh, basically that he was assuming there was some kind of fight going on between Officer Pryor and Mr. McHenry um, prior to his arrival, and I, excuse me, before his arrival. Uh, and um, is there any indication that Officer Nord's assumption of a fight between Pryor and McHenry before he arrived may have prejudiced his uh, his reactions or uh, or course of conduct when he when he did arrive and made a decision to uh, use lethal force. I can't speak to Nord's assumptions, but in his interview with us, he told us the reason he fire shots, it was because he felt Officer Pryor was in immediate danger of being shot by McHenry. Was there ever a, a I'll, I'll, let me, excuse me, let me strike that and move on. Uh, there, uh, I'd like, if we might, we can clarify the continuity regarding various things being reported in, as in uh, Mr. Kevin, Mr. McHenry's hands, um, specifically whether or not it's a phone or a gun. In, uh, on page eight of the security guard's statement, um, he states that the subject had a phone in his hand. Indeed, I, I think he, he mentions three times that he saw it lighted. Um, he, I think he identifies it twice as a tab, uh, twice as a phone, and once as either a tablet or a phone, and says he saw it lighted. Um, um, if we can address that first, uh, first off, did you locate a phone or a tablet? We, we located a phone. Okay, and uh, one that would be capable of uh, being lighted. Yes. Okay. Uh, did you? Were you able to determine where it was with regard to Mr. McHenry's hands? No. Um, the security guard who made those statements when the actual officer involved shooting took place was 175 feet from McHenry. So even though at the time of the security guard's contact with McHenry, he may have had a phone in his hand, it's a different uh, time than when the shooting took place. Did the security guard have a straight line view to the enclosure? 
at the time of the, excuse me, not at any time, at the time of the shooting? Somewhat, yes. Okay. Um, if you go to page six and seven of Officer Nord's, Nord's report, this is the same uh, clarifying continuity. Uh, he indicates that the gun was not in McHenry's hands, but located near him. Um, but then we have the shooting, and indeed we have uh, a photo that you showed us um, where it, it suddenly appears in his hands. Can, can you clarify what, it, what appears to be a continuity issue there? In Officer Nord's statement, he stated that the gun fell out of McHenry's waistband onto the ground. He then states McHenry reached for and grabbed the gun and turned toward Officer Pryor. Do you know if that's an assumption or, well, first off, let me clarify, is, do, you, do you have any indication that any officer actually saw a, a, a firearm in uh, Mr. McHenry's waistband? No. Um, so when Officer Nord says that it fell out of the waistband, um, it, given that it's, it's an assumption that it was in the waistband, is that based upon the fact that there were, I mean, do you know what that's based on? It's based on that he was reaching into his waistband, and when he felt the, that initial effect of the taser, his hands came forward, as well as the gun falling out. Um, do you have any idea why um, you know, his hands are behind him, and the waistband is obviously behind him, or the back, rear of the waistband, and then when the gun falls and is later reached for, it's, it's some, some distance in front of Mr. McHenry? I don't know. Um, Airsoft. Um, at, you've, you've shown the, uh, um, the pellets and the, uh, um, the Airsoft uh, device. Um, first off, uh, uh, is that is that legally a firearm, an our, an our soft uh, uh, pistol? It is not a firearm, although it does shoot at 275 feet per second with right. their projectiles. That being said, Officer Nord thought it was a firearm because it looks like a firearm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, do you have any indication that Officer Nord or indeed any officer at the scene um, knew that that was an airsoft um, device? I can only speak of Officer Nord who gave us a statement and he believed it to be a real firearm. Do you know when Officer Nord determined that it was an airsoft device? I do not know. After the incident. Oh, you, don't know, you don't know when? No. Okay. Um, it's it's mentioned you, I, I, it's mentioned in several sources and I believe you mentioned as well during the presentation that uh, Mr. McHenry was handcuffed and then I believe handcuffs were removed in order to take him out of the enclosure and placed back on. Um, is that normal procedure when you've gotten somebody shot like yes. that? Yes, it's officer safety. Um, at this point, I don't have any further questions, I'm sure, but I'd like to have an opportunity if I might. Yeah. Take a two-minute break to see if there's any further questions. Uh, I will take whatever break you'll give me, Thank you. I believe it'll take more than Okay, five-minute break. Thank you.
This is Carlos Bummer again. We're going to go. Good morning. Uh, we're going to resume. Um, Mr. Klaus. Your Honor, thank you for giving us that brief uh, moment to uh, confer. Um, after conference with the family, they would like me to clarify with the detective. Um, you mentioned that the level, in force, the level of force increased due to uh, uh, actions uh, of, of Mr. McHenry. Uh, um, if he was going to pull a gun, why did he not pull a gun, or a, a, in this case an airsoft device, on the security guard earlier? I don't know. Uh, during the, there was a timeline that was presented to us that was uh, uh, Part 15 of the force investigation team report, and in, in that timeline you have um, 020549 listed as a time that Officer Pryor discharged his taser at Mr. McHenry, 
and you have 0, 2, 0, 5, and 53 seconds as the uh, time that Officer Nord broadcast that shots were fired. So that's a that's a, a at most a four second gap, and the taser cycling period is a five second gap. Uh, if it takes the taser five seconds to cycle and be used upon somebody, why do we only have a four second gap before shots are fired? The full cycle of a taser is five seconds, but within that five seconds, numerous things happened, such as the gun falling from his waistband, grabbing the gun, according to Officer Nord, and pointing it towards Officer Pryor. Does it take five seconds for the taser to go into effect? No, it lasts five seconds. It immediately goes into effect when the trigger is pulled and lasts five seconds. Okay. Um, in several places in Officer uh, uh, Nord's report, uh, he talks about involuntary motions with regard to the uh, the They talk about involuntary mov movements, uh, such as uh, pushing, um, Mr. McHenry pushing his hands uh, forward. Um, is that an assumption that's an involuntary reaction as opposed to um, some other reaction? That was Officer Nord's perception at the time. Okay. Officer Nord had several perceptions he, uh, he talked about. Um, based upon uh, uh, he, what he perceived was going on in Officer Pryor's head, among other things. Um, would it be fair to say that Officer Nord's decision to shoot was based in part upon assumptions he was making about what Officer Pryor was thinking? I don't know what Officer Nord was assuming. I just know what he told me in his statement about why he pulled the trigger, which was, McHenry picked up the gun and turned towards Officer Pryor. He never actually had the gun pointed at Officer Pryor, is that correct? I'm sorry? He never actually had the, the gun, the airsoft device, pointed at Officer Pryor, is that correct? No, according to Nord, he picked it up and was turning towards him. Would there be any way that he would be able to determine that that was an airsoft device as opposed to a, a firearm in, a, in the context that this happened? No. Um, you, you mentioned that Mr. McHenry was, uh, had been, had attempted, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not trying to read something into the record that's not accurate, that he had attempted suicide in the past and he had been suicidal in prison. Uh, where did you get that information? All of our background information was obtained through records checks and family. Um, so when you say he'd attempted suicide in the past, that that been something you would have gotten from the family? Yes. Do you remember who? We interviewed both his mother and wife. So one of those. What about the what about the suicidal in prison? Was that from prison records? Just records. Yes. Did you talk to anybody in prison, or you just pulled records? Pulled records. Okay. So I, I believe it was Officer Pryor who. Um, Drew, drew his firearm after he made contact with Mr. McHenry um, in, the, in the parking area, and then Mr. McHenry walked away. Uh, I think we've got that on, mm -hmm. on a body cam. Why did he draw a gun if, if, if uh, Mr. McHenry had his back turned to him and was walking away? Officer Pryor chose not to give us a statement. Do you have, can you, can you surmise, or can you give us any 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 reason you might have determined? I mean, you, you investigated the use of force, correct? Yes. Uh, and drawing a firearm is a use of force. It's it's in our our use of force continuum, correct? Correct. So you investigated that as well. Uh, did, did you investigate the surrounding circumstances to the the drawing of that firearm? Um, and tell us a little bit about that. We conduct a criminal investigation, not so much the not the administrative at all. Right. And I cannot, I do not know what Officer Pryor's perceptions were at the time 
as to why he pulled a firearm out. Um, and by, by criminal investigation, you're talking about even up to and including potentially the officers being investigated. That's where you're talking about some of them chose to not make statements. The whole incident, yes. Right. Um, so, so whether or not an officer makes a statement, you're going to look at, at a use of force. Um, what was your analysis of the drawing of that firearm as, as Mr. McHenry turned, turned away and was, and was leaving that area? Did you have any analysis as to the appropriateness of that? Legally, no, because we don't know what his perception was, what his threat level, what threat he perceived at that time. Okay. Um, I think that, oh, I'm sorry, I, 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 occupational hazard, not being able to read my own handwriting. Um, the phone, do you know where it is right now? I believe the phone is impounded either through the police department or the coroner's office. I, I don't know exactly at this time. I can find out. Okay. Nothing further. Your Honor, if I could have just a couple of clarifying questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Detective Colon, uh, the information that your investigation revealed according to the body cameras of all three officers as well as the observations of, of Officer Nord, the statement that he provided. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that that revealed that Officer Pryor initially announced that he was going low lethal in the enclosure? And I'm talking about, I'm going to ask you some, some questions about what was happening right before the shots, okay? Yes. Uh, and right before the shots, Officer Pryor indicated, announced that he was going low lethal, correct? Yes. He then brought out the taser, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, he fired the taser into Mr. McHenry? Correct. Uh, it was an imperfect uh, strike of Mr. McHenry? Correct. Uh, but that taser did cause Mr. McHenry to fall forward? Yes, it appears so. When that occurred, a uh, firearm from his waist area, excuse me, a handgun from his waist area fell onto the ground behind Mr. McHenry? Yes. Uh, Mr. McHenry is then within moments seen reaching back and picking up that handgun? Yes. Uh, Mr. McHenry is then viewed moving with the handgun in his right hand, moving up towards Officer Pryor's position? Yes. And both Officer Nord and Officer Sutton on the body cameras indicate that they see the decedent with the gun in his hand? Yes. Uh, the gun turns out to be an airsoft gun? Correct. And that qualifies as a deadly weapon under Nevada law? Correct. It's not a firearm. It is considered a deadly weapon. Okay. Thank you. I have no other questions. Any further questions? No. This, not from me, however, there may be, um, do we have any, I don't know that there's any members of the public that had any. I don't know. Not, not for me, and that's are there any, I'll ask, are there any questions from the public? Okay, so this uh, public fact-finding review has been held because the Clark County District Attorney's Office made a preliminary determination that no criminal prosecution of the officers involved in the death of James McHenry is appropriate. Clark County Ordinance Chapter 2.12 requires a public review following such a determination. The purpose of today's hearing was to present the public with the essential facts surrounding the death of Mr. McHenry. Attorney Conrad Klaus was appointed by the Clark County Manager as the Ombudsman to represent the public and Mr. McHenry's family. Mr. Klaus, Klaus was given an opportunity to ask questions to provide the public with relevant information regarding the use of force in this case. I was appointed by the Clark County Manager as the presiding officer to preside over this public review. I too was given an opportunity to ask questions to provide the public with relevant information regarding the use of force in this case. Prior to today's public review, the Clark County District Attorney's Office provided Mr. Klaus and myself copies of the law enforcement investigation regarding the death of Mr. Thomas James McHenry. The documents provided by the prosecution are considered public record. If you missed a portion of this review, I would like to obtain a recorded transcript. A video of the entire proceeding is available on the Clark County website at www.clarkcountynv.gov. I see that there are questions uh, from the audience. Um, 
Yes, ma'am. You want to approach the uh, bench? Hi, my name is Carol Luke. I'm the natural mother of Thomas Joseph Bunch. He did later change his name to McHenry, but is Thomas Joseph, not James. But um, why, what, why was it when you're, they're saying that he was 15 feet and one inch away, Officer Pryor was. When I went to the crime scene and I measured it and everything, the video shows different than that. It shows Pryor a lot closer, even with the shadow on the wall, when he is walking toward my child. Okay, at that time when they tased him, he did have an involuntary movement forward, according to Nord, which he said Nord assumed the lot. Nord assumed that there was a physical altercation. Norm assumed that Pryor thought there was a handgun being pulled out while Pryor tased him. Okay, but why wasn't the gun kicked? Since he was so close, why was not the pellet gun kicked since my son was already in a, a reaction from it? Because even if it is a five second with both probes hitting, although it is a five second for full thing, still you can see and within four seconds he is shot and killed. Right, I, I appreciate your question. You know, and why, I, wasn't it cooked, why wasn't the gun kicked? Okay, so what we'll do is I'm going to go ahead and ask that question. Do you have any other further questions that you would oh, like I to ask? I got plenty of but I got distracted by my grandkids. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go ahead and ask that one question. And if there's any other questions, uh, ma'am, do you have a question? Yeah. We'll take a short break. What we're going to do is, uh, the way the protocol is done is that uh, the questions are generally written down and reviewed, and then I would determine whether they're relevant or not. I'm going to go ahead and ask that one question, but I'm going to ask any other further questions be written down. So if you have the opportunity to write the questions down now so that we can review them and determine whether they're appropriate or not. So we'll go ahead and ask the question whether, why, if you know whether the gun, why or was it not kicked? The only person who had been close enough to kick it, the uh, gun would have been Officer Pryor. He did not give us a statement. Officer Nord and Sutton were both on the outside of the enclosure and would not be able to reach the uh, firearm with their foot. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other written questions. Are there questions being written? Okay, we'll take a We'll take a two minute break.
Good morning. Uh, the time is about 10.45. I'm going to go ahead and uh, resume uh, from break. I have a question. Um, there's been an objection with respect to this question. With, um, sure. If you want to state your objection. From the state, Your Honor, uh, I would object based upon relevancy as well as assuming fact and evidence. Okay. Is there opposition to that? Uh, well, I, I would request that it be read, and if you don't, and if, if Your Honor does not believe it's appropriate to answer, um, or indeed not answerable, then that's the decision. But at least we have it read in the record at that point. Is there any problem with that reading? No. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, the question is, why was I lied to since detectives showed up and lied to me about Thomas being alive at 7 a.m. November 24, 2015? Why was I told he was in the ER fighting for his life? And... Uh, that's the question. So I'm going to decide that this is an irrelevant question with respect to the, uh, the review fact-finding process. Um, and go ahead. Are there any other questions that have not been submitted? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and conclude this police fatality public fact-finding review into the death of James McHenry. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody being here.